the way I've always looked at it was, I don't, I'm not going to fight the thoughts. I'm not going to fight the things that come into my head. I'm going to let them come in, and I'm going to let them leave. The less I spend thinking or fighting about it, the quicker they'll be gone. Right? I think we're all put on the earth to become something. Right? And in order to become, we have to be first. In order to be, we've got to be at peace. Today's podcast features former University of Washington basketball player Ryan Appleby. Ryan discusses his unique training style, his visualization and meditation process, and knowing oneself. This is part one of a two-part flow, and I hope you guys enjoy. This episode is sponsored by MindSport, the number one meditation app for athletes. Hello and welcome to the Flow Station Podcast. I'm your host, Will Ferris, and as always, the goal is to help you cultivate your unique flow by bringing on guests who have tapped into theirs. Speaking of someone who's tapped into his flow, I got my guy, Ryan Appleby, in the building of the day. My, uh, what was it? What did we play? Cornhole? My Cornhole partner? Yeah, Cornhole and Chelan. We were eating. Yeah. Uh, But thank you for coming on, bro. I look forward to this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it as well. Met Ryan in, in Chelan. We got some hoop workouts in and got to talk and this guy's deeply into flow as well so <laughs> had to bring him on just so we have a ground level communication I mean obviously you're known for your hoop skills um, but you had a unique journey to get there so just talk about your journey in hoop and and why why your skill development was so unique and how you felt like it enhanced your creativity as just a, a human being and as an athlete when I was coming out of Stanwood there was you know a couple thousand people in the town and there hadn't been a player that got a division one scholarship in all of Snohomish County Mm. in general in over 30 years and I was the first player to do that Um, and it was just I put in more hours and more time and you know my workouts um, uh, were were really focused um, and and to the point and and so I think when I got into you know when I got into to college or was getting recruited by colleges you know, we had I had colleges, college coaches from all over the country coming up to watch me at you know five thirty, six o'clock in the morning, work mm-hmm. out in high school in Stanwood. Um, you know, a lot of the coaches you still see on TV today were coming up to Stanwood to, to to watch me train, and the majority of them would say to my high school coach, "Does he really work out that hard by himself every single morning?" Mm-hmm. And he was like, "Yeah, he works out that hard every single day." Um, you know, I think that that's what got me to Florida. So I, I went to Florida and, and obviously I transferred from there and went to UW and it, I was always humble cause I knew, I knew I was blessed. Um, you know, and I, and I had to work so hard for it that, uh, that it, 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 it kept me grounded, but I, and I had a, uh, I always had a, a, a serious yearning to improve mm. as well. And I think that keeps you humble and grounded and, you know, some of the distractions, I, mean, I think we had Facebook, like, I think my sophomore year of college. I think Twitter came out, like, my senior year of college. Uh, so a lot of those kind of social media or now societal pressures, they weren't, they weren't really there. Mm-hmm. Um, you had, the, you had the, the pressures of, of you know, are you going to try to fit in? Or are you going to try and stand out? Are you going to try to spend more time hanging out with people, right? Or do you have goals and a vision that you're trying to work towards? Um, and, and that was a big thing that, that basketball taught me. And... Um, was being able to, you know, set goals um, and have a vision for your future and, and work towards it. But nowadays, it's a little bit harder to tap into that. You know, we have the cell phones, all these external things that can take us out. Sure. Um, talk about how you were able to maintain that as you developed as a player and then how you see it affecting players now as, as they, you know, are growing up in a young age and maybe have a love for the game, but it, that kind of gets faded away by the external pressures or the external things that, you know, can bog them down. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I uh, like going going back to the environment standpoint. You know, I didn't really have any neighbors growing up, and I had two sisters, so I wasn't gonna hang out in the house and play with them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, I had a dad that you know uh, liked basketball a lot, and so I went outside and I hooped, right? And I worked mm-hmm. on my game. I think that a lot of the uh, a lot of the distractions that kids have today, I didn't even have the really the opportunity to get distracted. You know, it was like, am I going to stay inside and play with my sisters or like, (laughs) am I going to watch TV? You know, I mean, when I'm a kid, right, we didn't have internet back then. We didn't have cell phones and all those type of things. So some of those like uh, external pressures, societal, you know, pressures to fit in, um, you know, I didn't have to, I didn't have to deal with those. 
what I saw was basketball players all the time and guys like Pistol Pete, you know, reading the books and watching the videos and all that. That's what I saw every single day. And I think at a young age, we, we mimic the things that we see, right? Um, and I think that's, that's what I did because I didn't, I didn't know anything else. I didn't really have anything else to see. Um, you know, when, once you got picked up for, by one of your parents after school, it was like, you're going to come home. Yeah. TV, sisters, homework, basketball, pretty easy choice, right? Um, and so I think that, that that's really what helped me. And, you know, kids today, they have, you know, they've got quite the undertaking, um, you know, with trying to keep themselves focused and not get distracted with, you know, social media and cell phones and the Internet and such. You talked a little bit about your, your training style and, and how unique that was and your inspiration of Pistol Pete. And, and we discussed the, the book, The Talent Code and, and Myelin and the, the nerve endings and, and different sure. things that, you know, maybe a lot of people haven't heard about. Talk about the YouTube camp comment I think you discussed with me uh, from the author from that book and, and why you think that it resonated with him that, hey, this is something that increases myelin and, and why your training style is so unique. Yeah, I think the talent code was 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 super interesting because, you know, growing up, you kind of go to basketball camps and everybody kind of has their own opinion on how you should dribble, pass or shoot. Uh, I think as you start to get older, intuitively, you start to go, if you've done it enough, you know, this is right and this is wrong. And then part of it also comes from just the success failure as well um, side. Um, so I think Talent Code, I can't remember if it was about 2010 or something when the book came out, I, it, uh, it, it gave us context, I think, from a different side of, uh, of, you know, everybody would always, as I was growing up, would talk about muscle memory, and, mm. and uh, Talent Code did a good job of discrediting that from a neurological standpoint um, and how your, your muscles um, uh, are really just puppets and whatever your mind is telling them to do, they're going to do. And so to make sure that, you know, for instance, let's just talk about shooting a basketball. Uh, everybody has different size hands, different wingspan, arm length, height, athleticism, you know, depth perception, et cetera. Um, that those are some of the things that go into shooting a basketball. Uh, but there are certain elements with shooting a ball, regardless of those things, whether regardless of your hand size or athleticism or whatever, that every player needs that needs to do. I think a book like The Talent Code helped with that. Um, you know, having the you know making sure the 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 correct neuromuscular pathways fire when you're, for instance, when you're shooting a basketball. Uh, you know, you're creating that myelin, which people would call muscle memory, even though that's not really true, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think. Uh, I think those things help uh, if players, you know, are mindful of them. I think they they help in skill enhancement just or, or improvement just in general um, because there's science behind it and it and it proves it. Yeah. Uh, relative to some high school, middle school AU coach's opinion on something. Yeah, and and we got to train over the week in in Chelan, and I definitely noticed there were certain elements of that. We talked about futsal where it's basically condensed soccer and yep. we did a couple of drills where there's two chairs and it's a we're basically shrinking the court and playing in smaller areas and finishing in different ways. So it's pretty cool to see that in, in live action and then talk to you about it. Uh, but then also circling back to just your journey and you talked about just how you were able to get lost in the process of becoming better um, mm-hmm. just because there wasn't really many external distractions and you were really grounded you know, regardless of that. How fulfilling was it you know, I guess not necessarily for an external benefit. You know, obviously you're a successful basketball player, but just internally when you were able to right. be successful and also develop it, your skills and yourself as a human being. Yeah, I think uh, I think there's a fine line to that. I think there's a fine line to being super driven, focused, type A type personality and being able to enjoy the ride or enjoy mm-hmm. the journey. I think because I was good at a young age and I'm kind of naturally more kind of type A, focus driven, I think that, uh, you know, looking back on my career, you know, when I was done, you know, for a couple of years after that, I, I thought back to some things that, you know, I had achieved that, you know, were goals that I had set as a kid or whatever. And I kind of went, man, did I take the time to enjoy that? Or was it always about the next goal? Right. Or, you know, the next feat or the next thing that you could do or achieve. Um, so I think there's there's a there's a fine line between achieving your goals um, and being successful and being focused and driven. 
um, to get there. But you know, you need to you need to uh, enjoy them because those are the re- part of the rewards of the journey, along with the lessons that you have. Um, and so I think that's one thing looking back on on my career is I wish I would have probably enjoyed some of those things a little bit more in the moment, as opposed to always trying to get to the next goal. Yeah, and obviously you achieved a lot of great things there and and we got to talk a little bit about your visualization process that you had um, which seemed to be very unique especially at that point in time I had never done anything really like that but I had you know certain experiences like one time I had a dream before a game and the exact same thing happened from the dream right Um, so I was like I was always aware that there was possibilities outside of my you know conscious you know, linear thinking of time. Right. But I, I never really tapped into it deeper. I probably should have. Uh, but maybe if you could just describe what you used to do before games at UW and what, why you think it helped you and what your intention was when you did it. Yeah, I think growing up, I was a student of the game, right? So I was always, and just being focused and driven, I was trying to find a way to constant, constantly improve. There was a couple old books like The Inner Game of Tennis and The Power of the Subconscious Mind. I think, uh, I think, a mindset, I, all of us can say, is something you need to have to be successful, a certain type of mindset. Um, and I was trying to find ways to continuously improve. And one of those things is the mindset, not just mental toughness and, and those type of things when adversity comes, but how does, how does uh, you know, how can your mind affect uh, your, uh, your play or your outcomes positively or negatively. I remember one of my teachers growing up would complain to my mom because I would only check out books at the school library when we had to read a book that had something to do with basketball, <laughs> right? Um, and it, it was kind of one of those things I was always looking for a way to improve. And uh, uh, the what I would do at in high school, I started doing it in high school and at, at UW, my rest of my career was... Um, I would make sure I was rested, right? I wasn't. Uh, uh, I wasn't gonna be able to. You can't do this if you're tired and wanting to fall asleep, right? But I, I would get to a state of of meditation, right, where you start out uh, just getting your mind centered and at peace, right, where you're not thinking about the past or the future, um, especially in sports that can affect your outcomes. Uh, you know, when you're in the past you feel depressed or unconfident and when you're in the future you feel anxious right you want to play in play in the present be in the present moment and be grounded um and so getting into that meditative state and then from there once you're in that state um playing the game in your mind before the game so i would go i would go through different sets that we ran and stuff and see myself making the shots uh, making certain passes making certain plays seeing uh i was a student of the game so i was i was one thing i was good at was being able to remember the other team's plays um so i would see myself defensively rotating you know I, you'd play in the game in your mind mm. um before you actually go out there and play that and then from there it's just you know once you do that then actually getting into the game and staying focused i had a routine that i would do obviously like a lot of players do of of drills or shooting that they would go through before the game um but the, the big thing to me, the competitive edge, I still think since we are in the today, the day and age of information, I still don't understand why more people uh, haven't tapped into this. But, you know, the visualization aspect, I think, is uh, is something that is a competitive advantage for sure. Were there some times where you, you saw ex- or you experienced exactly what you were visualizing beforehand? Or was it just an ability to relax and and know or give yourself the confidence that hey I can I can do this when the when the lights are shining and I'm actually out there like what was the intention that you had behind it? Uh, I think I think with the visualization the intention behind it is uh, to help build your confidence reassure yourself um, that you can do um, what you've been training or practicing to do. Um, I think. Uh, you know, when the when the lights are on and the popcorn is popping, there's some guys that are gamers and there's some that aren't. Um, and I believe a lot of that it just comes down to somebody's ability to control their own mind. Mm. Um, and so f- for me, it, it was to try to just control my own mind. Um, you know, when you go out there and you visualize and then you go out and play and you're and you're playing well, there's no surprise to it. You've already done it in your mind. You've already played the game in your mind. And I think that was the uh, that that was the biggest thing for me was I knew it was giving me a competitive edge because I believed what I was seeing. 
you also described fear kills instinct. So those right. two things and how those might affect flow um, in terms of, you know, fear, but also believing in yourself and, and how those two go hand in hand. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, when we talked about fear kills instinct, I think that if you're not in a centered place, if you're, uh, you know, if you're in the past or you're in the future, I think that uh, um, something like fear, anxiety, or worry or doubt, those things come into your mind. And especially in sports, it's all instinct. Like a lion doesn't think when it hunts, it mm. just hunts, right? There's no logic to it. It's all instinct. And I think that when we're out there, you know, on the field or the court, you know, competing, it's all instinct. Um, and in order to be in that instinctive state, you have to stay centered. Um, dribble, passing, and shooting, playing defense, and rotating, and whatever it is in the game, it's all instinctual. You've done it long enough. Um, and I think that if you can't stay in that center place, I think fear is the thing that takes over um, for a lot of players, even though they don't want, want to admit it. Um, I think it takes over and then it, it affects, uh, you know, their performance negatively. I've gotten into mindfulness meditation a little bit and, and mm -hmm. looked into the principles of that. And so let's say you take someone who has a fearful thought. Like, let's say I get in the game, I'm 0 for 4 from 3, and my self-talk is like, oh, I can't miss this next one. You know, it's more of like a fearful what if. Like, what if I miss this next one? What more would pressure. happen? More pressure. Yeah. If, if you're developing a practice like my meditation where you're trying to stay centered and you're not trying to fight thoughts, but you're also trying to control those thoughts in, in a way that's you're not afraid of the moment and you stay present, you stay grounded and centered. How, how would you describe the, I guess, the dichotomy between those two? Seeing a thought for what it is and not fighting it, but also not letting it take you out of the deal in, in, in the present moment. Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing this this a lot of this stuff pertains to just life in general, being good at anything yeah. or being successful at anything. I don't in sports, right? You're kind of in fight mode, right? Because you're in people would say competition. Mm. I don't think that I'm somebody that did really really believes in competition. I think that uh, um, I think that's kind of more ego based. I think that you know really it's just you got a certain level of determination and you choose to have it or you don't. Um, I don't think it's really really a competition thing. So from the way I've always looked at it was I don't I'm not gonna fight the thoughts. I'm not gonna fight the things that come into my head. I'm gonna let them come in and I'm gonna let them leave. The less I spend thinking or fighting about it, the quicker they'll be gone. Right? I think we're all put on the earth to become something. Right? And in order to become, we have to be first. In order to be, we've got to be at peace. Right? So we, the meditation state is the be. The visualization state helps us to become. But you can't start visualizing if you're not in a centered place um, in that state of being. Um, uh, you know, from the Bible, be still and know that I'm God. Mm -hmm. Right? That's that place. Um, you know, to, to be. I think that's why you've got to learn to center yourself and learn the meditation and discipline aspect of meditation first before you go into the visualization state, which, which helps you become, which helps you perform out on the court or the field um, or, or, or whatever it may be. Um, because if not, you're in fight or flight mode, which we had talked about, you know, mm -hmm. the other day. And fight or flight mode is is periods of anxiousness, fear, worry, doubt, insecurity, stress. Um, and I think a lot of people, they feel like that gives them energy and it, and it can, I think we've all been in those states before and you try to use those things to propel you forward. But I don't think you can be at your best in, in that state because you're not, you're not instinctive, you're reactionary, you know, uh, it's, it's always better to be strategic than it is reactionary. The things we I was just describing, fear, worry, doubt, insecurity, those are emotions. You know, uh, seeing things as they are, not as your emotions color them, is something that, uh, that I've always uh, reminded myself of. Not everything you think is real, mm. right? A lot of our thoughts are emotion-based and they're super temporary. Um, emotions come and go throughout the day. Um, and it's exhausting to ride the wave of emotions. Um, so I think kind of that whole combination of the things we just talked about, um, you know, is, 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 is super key um, going from that meditative to visualization state. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot to unpack there. And I think you said it really well. In certain states, I mean, I think anxiety and depression are on the rise. You know, yeah. I mean, it's pretty clear. It's pretty evident. No matter how much we attain or get, and I think you hit it right on the head. We have to be human beings before, you know, we're human doers. Mm-hmm. We're going out and doing all these different things. But let, let's say somebody's in a state that they just feel very anxious. And you talked about that instinctual feeling instead of just thinking about it. Would you say in terms of a game aspect or, or just people in day-to-day life that, that are dealing with those things, is that, the, is that similar where they just feel the emotion, they feel the, the thought, let it go, and then back to where they are in the present moment? These things do take a lot of time, um, a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of mm-hmm. practice like anything else to, yeah. become, to become good at them. I would say that if if there is, I mean, we're 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 all human beings. We all have had a a time of depression, thoughts, or anxiety, or fear, or whatever it may be. Um, I think that the biggest part of that is, you know, you've got to know yourself. You've got to first figure out, know yourself, know your emotions, know why you're thinking what you're thinking, um, understand that. Wait, I'm feeling this, but what was I just thinking about? Mm. You know, and, and and for a lot of us, you know, if, if we can train ourselves to be mindful and be at peace and to visualize outcomes, we've we can also unconsciously train ourselves to think fear based thoughts, um, to think anxious thoughts. And because we've done it so long, we don't realize what we're doing mm. um, and it becomes our day to day thought life. And a lot of people become a prisoner of their own mind. And I think that that's uh, that's that that mindfulness to know what we're feeling and to know why we're think why we're thinking that um, why we're anxious, I think is something that people need to spend more time doing, as opposed to uh, going externally to find all the answers. I think you know God put in us everything that we need in order to be on this earth and to live our own journey, and I think we spend too much time externally trying to plug holes and find solutions. For the things that really are bothering us, they're all internal, hmm. right? They're not external. It's right. the internal things that are bothering us. It's how we're feeling. It's how we're dealing with our emotions or what we're thinking that are really affecting us in a depression state or unhappiness or whatever. And we need to be more responsible um, for our emotions, for our feelings, for our thoughts, Right, everybody always tells you to be responsible for your actions, but the action is kind of the external result of what we're thinking or feeling, right? Um, and not to downplay, you know, anybody's own personal journey and how difficult, you know, uh, anxiety or depression may be. I do think it started somewhere um, at some point before the feeling from a thought based or a situation that you had that trained you to think a certain way. And I think we need to go back in time and find that place where it all started and retrain ourselves um, to, uh, to, to get to that place of, of the mindful meditation into the visualization. Yeah, that's beautifully put, man. Obviously, we, we, you talked about knowing yourself and finding your truth. Maybe talk a little bit about how you found that on your journey in Hoop and just, you know, that process. And also maybe the necessary requirements to do so, like loving yourself or, or non-judgment. Because yeah. I, I think a lot of times when you go through those processes and you're looking at your thoughts, and you're like, wow, like I don't like that about myself. A lot of times you run from it or you just push it away, and that's what really starts to stir it up more, uh, at least just in my experience. Yeah. Talk about that in your journey of hoop and, and how that really started this. I, I, I mean, obviously you've been in the self-improvement of, of hoop, but also mm-hmm. – you know, how did that jumpstart you into what you're doing now and, and who you are today? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, for me, like I was saying earlier, I'm, I was always pretty just kind of focused and determined uh, growing up. And so I was just kind of type A and, uh, you know, trying to set goals. Let's go accomplish them. What do I got to do? Whatever I got to do, I'm, I'm just willing to do it. I'm willing to live it. I'm willing to go through it. I just got to get to that end result, right? I think that's just kind of always been part of uh, of who I am, and I didn't spend enough time figuring out, you know, which would have helped me in basketball, you know, who I who am I, right? Uh, because a lot of times in in sports, you're just looking at things that could distract you, 
All right? And because I just got to get to the goal. So no distractions, no distractions. We don't deal with ourselves. Hmm. Um, I, th- I think is, is the biggest thing. We don't want to spend the time to deal with ourselves because we feel like, uh, you know, we may lose self-confidence or we feel like it's a distraction that's going to slow us down um, from getting to that goal, goal that we have. And I think that before you, you really, especially as you start to get older, before you make big life decisions like what, what, what I'm going to become in my, my career, or what you're going to, who you're going to marry or when you're going to get married or have kids or, you know, any type of big life decisions, right? Um, I think you need to know who you are. I think that that's the biggest thing. And I don't think just as a society, we try and figure out who we truly are. You know, we're, we're a soul and a human experience, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we need to spend more time learning who we are and then let our soul appraise uh, what we do um, with our lives. I think we all get too caught up in so- the societal norms or pressures of, of, of achievement, career path, uh, having certain things by a certain age. If you don't have certain things, you don't, you're, you're not adding value or you're not a person of, of value, you know, external things, material possessions, things like that. Um, so I think the biggest thing for me was when I got done playing basketball, I was done playing because I couldn't do it anymore, which for me was basically, I couldn't be that guy anymore. Um, and the reason I couldn't be that guy was cause I didn't really know that wasn't really me. Mm-hmm. Right. It, there was nothing wrong with me not with loving the game and working as hard as I did, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't truly know myself. So when I quit playing, I quit playing because I just couldn't be that guy anymore. And when I couldn't be that guy, and for me, I was kind of lucky because the economy was such in a bad place back then that most of the people were trying to just find a random job and they were living at home. So when I got done playing, I uh, I got into basketball training and training players. And we were talking earlier kind of off camera that, you know, it was almost a way for me to kind of not go cold turkey um, from basketball uh, to kind of wean myself off of it. Um, so there was a little bit of uh, a therapy involved in, in what I was doing as a, along with, you know, having a passion to see people improve just like I had the same passion in myself to, to challenge myself to improve. Um, so from that standpoint, I think that, uh, I was put in a position where I didn't have a lot to do except for deal with myself and really, you know, uh, learn who I was. And at the same time being focused and driven, um, you know, it was a challenge for me to kind of, I, I want to improve myself still, right? That's always been a big thing for me is try to be the best that I can be at whatever I'm doing. And at that point in my time, because of, the, once again, the environment that I was in, I didn't really have anything else to do but to deal with myself and improve myself. And so I think a lot of those things, you know, that we've been talking about today have, you know, they came from my my journey through basketball. I learned some of these things because I had to in order to improve, but there's a lot of a lot of it that, you know, was self-reflection, looking back on my journey, learning the things after the fact as well, and still being the person that I was at five years old or my age now is, uh, you know, trying to trying to improve myself and, and finding ways to improve. And I do think that a big part of all of us living this human experience is to be the best, you know, person individually that we can be and to you know to max our our, our skills and abilities that god-given abilities that, that that we've been given yeah that's beautiful man and so you know circling back to hoop a little bit you get to gas gas up maybe one moment in your career um you know what's one moment you felt like you were deeply in that flow state or or that peak experience uh, if you have like one game it could be in high school college professionally what was one one moment like that, and maybe did that help push you to look deeper into things like meditation or visualization, or improving yourself, and using that to really motivate you to get even better in certain areas of your life? Yeah, I think that, uh, like I said, I was always pretty good growing up, um, and uh, I was always pretty highly ranked um, middle school, and then coming in into high school, and. I think what happened was, you know, I had to find, 
it was just back to self-improvement. I had to find a way to keep improving what's a competitive edge. And I felt another competitive edge for me was to get up in the morning at 5.30 and 6 a.m. and get a workout in when you're tired um, and and you don't want to do it. Nobody wants to get up that early and work out. Um, it kind of takes some of the fun out of it. And it was, and it's a, it's a struggle to do it, but I found that I was, I was going to challenge myself, which would make me physically and mentally tougher. And then I could put in more hours and the, cause I could work out in the morning and then go hoop after school as well. Um, and it was at that point when I started to see kind of a strategy or a game plan that I put together for myself um, to improve. And then you start getting letters from colleges on things that you've, and you visualize those things. I think kind of that time frame from, you know, eighth grade to 10th grade, um, was, uh, was kind of a big momentum builder for me, a big confidence builder, um, uh, from, from, from that standpoint. So I think it was around that time where I was like, I can do this. Hmm. I felt like I could, I, I could see myself doing it. Um, I added some more tools to my bag. I challenged myself some more physically and mentally every single morning. I was putting in more hours than everybody else was. Um, and I was starting to reap the benefits of the things that I had seen in the past, visu- the visualization standpoint, before I had actually, um, you know, upped my hours uh, and my physical um side to my training and so I think around that that time frame from 8th to 10th grade was like okay all this stuff does really work mm. you know um, but it but it takes time you know you and I were talking the other day uh, Joe Dispenza is a guy that started to become super popular uh, on the internet and social media over the last couple of years um, as a guy that's big into visualization and meditation and those type of things and basically uh, you know transforming your life um, personally or uh, from a career standpoint and seeing those things. And he talked, I listened to him talk one time, probably about a year ago, and he talked about, uh, you know, when he first started going around the country and around the world and speaking, everything sounded so good to people. But mm. it wasn't for like a year to a year and a half till he started getting the emails and the phone calls from people going, wow, this really works. Um, you know, people were starting to see the results. Like anything, things take time. You've got to go down that journey. You've got to have enough faith to go down the journey and see the things through, and and uh, uh, you know, and 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 be uh, mindful enough of what you're doing every single day um, to improve. And you know, I think that's one of the things that we just talked about earlier from that eighth to tenth grade year. But you know, with Joe talking about that. Um, kind of proves the point of meditation or visualization. It's like anything else. It's a practice. It's something that we have to keep improving on. We've got to do it daily. Um, and you're not going to see the results overnight, which is going to be super difficult for a lot of people mm-hmm. today because they can get so much free information so quickly. Um, but I just, I don't think there's, to, to be good or be successful or be your best uh, person or be better at something, um, it's still the it's still the time. Yeah, and that's so true. I mean, I look back on my career, I'm sure you can too. It's like to get to where you got, you know, it took so many years, like so right. many hours as a little kid shooting around. I think as I've gotten, finished my college career and I go into all these different fields of meditation and studying, it's like I wanted that, I wanted to be at college level in meditation right off the bat. And it was like, if I wasn't, it was something's wrong, something's wrong. Right. So I think that's great insight that there's a ton of patience that's involved in all these practices, everything that you do, and understanding yourself especially. Viewing it as an investment, not really as a quick trade, but as something that you're going to work towards and always continue to improve in, I think that's that's huge. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. This was only part one of a two-part interview with Ryan Appleby, so stay tuned for the next one. I wanted to give another quick shout out to my sponsor, MindSport. MindSport is a meditation app made specifically for athletes. If you want to improve your performance on and off the court, lower your stress levels, learn the foundations of meditation and yoga, and improve your quality of sleep, this app is for you. Make sure to give it a download in the iTunes App Store, and we'll see you in the next video.